Welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Lynda.com. And a little later on, I'll be bringing you news of an offer from them, as well as what is coming up in episode 9. The HistoryNetwork.org podcast, season 8, episode 8. Parcels from Home, the story of the Red Cross parcels in World War II. This episode was written by Mark Webster. Mark is a New Zealand historian and tech writer who recently completed a history of Red Cross parcels in World War II. Millions of parcels were sent to hundreds of thousands of prisoners of war. Webster's books focus on the New Zealand experience, but also covers the global humanitarian scheme. The Parcels From Home books will be published in 2015 on Apple's iBooks platform. A student version by Steve Bolton, Parcels From Home, plus a historian's compendium version with more detail and a chapter on prisoners of the Japanese. After World War II, former New Zealand prisoner of war gunner Jim Henderson wrote, We used to say after the war the Red Cross should take over the world and run it. They'd shown what they could do in a world mad with war. Most people know about the Red Cross. During the War of Italian Unification between Imperial Austria and the Franco-Sardinian Alliance, Swiss businessman Henri Dunant visited the northern Italian battlefield in Solferino in 1859. Deeply affected by the 40,000 mostly unattended casualties on the battlefield, Dunant wrote A Memory of Solferino founded the Relief Society that became the Red Cross and was the first recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1901. As soon as World War II was imminent, Red Cross societies everywhere, even in Japan, increased their efforts to be useful to soldiers and casualties of every persuasion. The effort was worthy of praise everywhere, but the very successful efforts to send parcels so far, all the way from distant New Zealand to Allied prisoners in European camps, adds a fascinating note. Immediately war was declared in late 1939, the International Red Cross increased its efforts to medically train tens of thousands of people, worked to outfit medical services and started to gear up to send soldiers parcels. At first these were known as soldiers' comforts, but once large numbers of French, Belgian and English prisoners were taken around Dunkirk, or otherwise from the fall of France and Belgium, the British Red Cross began to supply food, clothing and materials to German POW camps. The soldiers' comfort parcels were adapted and sent to POWs by international agreement, and this scheme came to be replicated in many countries, including neutral Argentina and the natural, at that point, United States. The New Zealand Red Cross Society was founded in 1915 as an associate of the British Red Cross. It was known as the New Zealand branch of the British Red Cross and became the New Zealand Red Cross in 1931. During World War I, when the British Red Cross partnered with the Order of St John for the duration of the war with a joint committee, this was replicated in New Zealand, where the Red Cross formed a joint committee with the Order of St John, known to this day in New Zealand for its ambulance services. This partnership and governing body was again set up in both countries during World War II, with all parcel efforts being coordinated and run by the Joint Committee from the New Zealand capital city of Wellington. Over a 100,000 New Zealanders served in World War I from a tiny population of just over one million, the British Red Cross managed to get some parcels to Allied prisoners. A New Zealand POW, Bert Hansen, an unfortunate among the scant 512 Kiwi soldiers captured in the Great War, recounted afterwards that he never saw a parcel 
and those who did receive them usually had them pilfered by the German guards first anyway. New Zealand sent supplies for parcels and medical equipment, plus money, to the British Red Cross, and some of this was allocated to help POWs. World War II was quite a different story. A provision of the Geneva Convention was added between the wars to help safeguard the well-being of prisoners of war. This was ratified by most countries, with the notable exceptions of Russia and Japan. This was the third treaty to the Geneva Convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war, concluded on July 27, 1929. The treaty entered into effect on June 19, 1931, and in simplified terms meant the originating power and next of kin had to be notified of each individual's capture. Prisoners were to be entitled to humane treatment and to be treated alike. If questioned, a POW was only bound to supply name, rank and serial number. The enemy power could impound military equipment except for articles of clothing and feeding utensils, but personal effects and money could be taken but was supposed to be returned upon release. POWs would be subject to the military discipline of the detaining power but would be supplied with adequate clothing and food and provided medical care. Prisoners of war had the right to correspond regularly with relatives at set intervals, receive food parcels and other relief, be attended by clergymen of their own religions, and be entitled to elect representatives. Camps would be allowed visits by International Red Cross and other aid delegates. Finally, prisoners who were repatriated through ill health or other reasons would not be allowed to resume military work, at least in the same theatre in which they had been captured. Other ranks, officers were off the hook, must not be compelled to do military work, nor work which was unhealthy, degrading or dangerous. These measures went a long way to ensuring much better treatment of prisoners of war and was signed by Britain, the USA, France, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Germany and Italy, among others. Those who didn't ratify included the Japanese, who used it as an excuse to treat prisoners very badly and impacted on Russian prisoners of the Germans. Since the Soviet Union did not sign the treaty, Germany did not feel compelled to look after Soviet prisoners at all, leading to staggering rates of deaths of over 50% among Russian POWs. In both cases, non-ratification of the treaty allowed these two countries to exercise their cultural and racial prejudices on the unfortunates who fell into each other's hands. The main impetus behind New Zealand developing a comprehensive parcel scheme was that, unlike the First World War, a relatively large number of New Zealanders were captured in World War II. The Commonwealth had 353,941 combatants captured by the Axis, or 8.8% of all soldiers committed overseas. The greater proportion of these were in the bag by 1942, but for New Zealand the ratio was higher. As for soldier attrition, 30.8% of New Zealand soldiers who served overseas became battle casualties as against 18.9% for the Americans and 21.6% for the British. At least a third, if not half, of these figures for those New Zealanders invalided out of the war are hard to come by, languished in prison camps. The term casualties included killed, wounded, beyond battle worthiness, and captured, anyone unable to continue fighting. The British had 35.6% of total losses registered as POWs, the Australians 47.9%, South Africans 53.6% and the Canadians just 8.5%. For New Zealand, it meant one in 200 of the entire New Zealand population ended up behind enemy barbed wire, mostly European. They were a large part of John Ellis's stated total in his book The Sharp End of the War. 
of 229.2 per thousand casualty rate. New Zealand had 11,928 fatalities of a total of 104,000 who served with the second New Zealand Expeditionary Force, but almost as many ended up behind barbed wire, 9,069 if you include merchant marines, flyers around 600 and a few around 100 who fell into Japanese hands. The large hauls of New Zealand captives came early in the war, just four campaigns fought by the second New Zealand Expeditionary Force during the first half of the war accounted for 94% of the 8,369 infantrymen who fell into enemy hands between 1939 and 1945. First, there was Greece, the first, second and third echelons of the New Zealand division were dispatched to the Middle East. The second arrived via the United Kingdom, where they had done a stint in transit of invasion guard. From the Middle East, the New Zealand division joined an effort to save Greece from falling to the Italians. Unfortunately, the Germans then invaded, and the picture rapidly turned against the Allies who opposed them, mostly British, Australian and New Zealand forces. The Allies on paper looked like a ready bolster against the Italians, who had already been fought to a standstill by the poorly equipped Greeks, but the Allies were rapidly eclipsed by a lightning German invasion using large numbers of tanks. Moreover, the German army was able to call on well-coordinated air support. The Allies almost immediately conceded mastery of the air to the Luftwaffe, and from then on the campaign descended into a rapid and desperate retreat to the southern coast for evacuation. The entire Allied force numbered 54,000 British, Australian and New Zealand troops, plus support units. Not every soldier made it onto a ship. Some units were cut off or overrun, medical staff were left behind with their patients, and some soldiers were caught waiting in vain for ships in small harbours. In all, 1,856 New Zealanders were captured in mid-1941. The withdrawal from Greece began on Anzac Day, 25th of April 1941. Many of those who got away from Greece ended up joining the British garrison on Crete, along with many Australians, but after a German airborne invasion and subsequent collapse in evacuation, another 2,180 New Zealand POWs were taken, the most New Zealanders captured in one battle. Of these, 67 Maori battalion men were captured, of whom 46 were wounded. Total losses were 1,780 Allies killed on Crete and 12,000 captured, including New Zealanders, Australians, Greeks, Cretans and British. Finally, in November to December 1941, during Operation Crusader in the North African desert, New Zealand battalions were left exposed to the enemy when English armoured support failed to materialise. The disasters at Sidi Rezeg and Belhamad led to another 2,042 New Zealanders being taken, and yet more, 1,819, were subsequently taken at El Mrir and Ruaisat Ridge. The impact back in New Zealand was dramatic. Thousands of people were getting letters saying their sons, brothers, fathers and uncles were now prisoners of war. The Red Cross, with government support, rapidly created a parcel packing facility by its Wellington headquarters, but until the packing could really get up to speed, the New Zealand Red Cross contracted the Canadian Red Cross to send parcels on its behalf over four months, around 2,500 parcels. These New Zealand marked parcels were distributed to all Allied POWs. The chances of a New Zealander getting a New Zealand parcel were pretty minimal, although almost all New Zealand POWs interviewed recalled getting some. At first, New Zealand POWs were split between Italian campos, in the case of those captured in North Africa, and German camps in the fatherland and occupied territories like Poland and Czechoslovakia, in the cases of those captured in Greece and Crete. Eventually, though, almost all the New Zealand POWs ended up in German-controlled stalags, 
because Italy changed sides and the Germans moved quickly to ship 2,614 New Zealand prisoners in Italy to camps in Austria, Germany, Czechoslovakia and Poland. Several hundred others had escaped, with varying degrees of success in the interim. By late 1941, New Zealand's parcel enterprise had already become impressive. The New Zealand Society was already handling over 6,000 parcels per week, with the aim of getting one food parcel to each prisoner per week for the duration of the war. Alongside these, the New Zealand Red Cross, along with other national Red Cross societies, was packing clothing parcels for prisoners' initial needs and coordinating so-called knock next of kin parcels at a rate of four per year per prisoner. These were supposed to be packed by prisoners' families to a prescribed and supplied parcel size with a list of items that could and could not be included. Since every parcel had to be censored, no handguns or metal files were allowed, the Red Cross took on this activity and used the unpack-repack process to bolster any parcels that seemed a bit lacking, adding items like chocolate bars. Unlike the food parcels, the knock parcels were handled at depots outside Wellington as well, in Auckland, Dunedin and Christchurch. Meanwhile, of course, the New Zealand Red Cross, and again along with other national societies, was equipping medical services and maintaining and supplying large hospital ships, along with many other relief tasks. By the end of 1941, the New Zealand Red Cross Society had already spent 245,000 New Zealand pounds, according to an internal New Zealand Red Cross memo for that year. For comparison, that's around 21 million New Zealand dollars or 16 million US dollars in today's money. The money was raised from donations from across the country in efforts coordinated by a governmental body that sought to equitably allocate finances across a range of charities and relief efforts. The diet in prison camps was barely adequate. In the Italian camps, the POWs got watery soup with a little cabbage, plus tiny amounts of meat if they were lucky. With this was a yellowish maize bun and small amounts of cheese, macaroni, rice, sometimes lentils, and sometimes a darker rye bread, depending where they were. Prisoners sometimes got rough red Italian army wine issued. In the German camps, the original diet circa 1941 was an issue of mint leaf tea each morning, swede or barley soup, and potatoes at noon, and at night bread, margarine, sugar and sausage. Sometimes coffee was issued. It was widely believed to be made from acorns. Gunnar Henderson recalled it. Tasted like burnt ink. As the war progressed, the official rations were successively cut. The soup became more watery and perhaps had some stringy horse meat in it. German civilians were having their rations cut too. Germany was under blockade, and as the tide turned against the Third Reich, it was increasingly hard to get food and other produce back from its conquered territories. Sometimes men in work camps near farms could find or trade for better items of food, but considering the climate and the fact that many men were being put to work, the supplied diet was hard to subsist on. Ironically, German prisoners incarcerated in the US from 1942 onwards after American entered the shooting war were fed as if they were US soldiers, as per the provision of the Third Treaty of the Geneva Convention. Since the GIs had the best diets of most combatants, the German POWs could hardly believe their luck, but their rations were reduced from mid-1944 as German atrocities against particularly Soviet POWs came to the attention of the West. Compared to official prison diets, the Red Cross food parcels formed a very welcome and positive bounty. They contained jam, cheese, spam or other tinned meat, tinned or dried vegetables, tinned sardines or other fish, biscuits, cigarettes, tobacco, chocolate and dried or condensed milk, tea and coffee. The New Zealand parcels had their contents carefully analysed 
and set by nutritionist Dr. Muriel Bell with the aim that each prisoner should receive an additional 12,316 calories a week, or 1,759 per day. The contents of a New Zealand Red Cross POW food parcel circulate 1942 consisted of cheese, coffee and milk, butter, dried fruit, tea, jam, two different types of canned meats, dried peas, emergency ration chocolate, honey and raw sugar, all in reasonable amounts. When the first parcel arrived, one POW noted, we carried them back to our rooms and gloated over them. The first cup of tea was like drinking nectar. If the men got one parcel each week, times were good, and a roaring trade ensued as non-smokers traded their cigarettes for cherished items of food. But at times the parcels were scarce and had to be carefully divided up, the Germans often bayoneted the tins so they couldn't be hoarded for escape attempts. A major factor, perhaps unforeseen, was the cold. Many food items are simply unpalatable when eaten cold, a tin of corned beef, for example. Almost immediately, pressure was put on the sparse camp cooking facilities. In time, prisoners developed ingenious solutions, including a widely used forced air furnace that could boil a billy of water in under a minute using a very small amount of fuel. These blower stoves were built almost entirely from the contents of the Red Cross parcels. Every type of tin found an additional use, with the big strong Canadian Klim powdered milk tins being particular favourites. To men bored out of their wits, the paper, string, cardboard and even the wooden packing crates were all carefully taken apart and put to many ingenious new uses, with designs being passed from camp to camp when prisoners were transferred around for various reasons, discipline, overcrowding, work requirements or whatever. Meanwhile, especially later in the war, POWs removed every second baton from wooden bunks for fuel and even some of the rafters from their huts in their desperate quests for fuel. In one hut, the table legs were removed and burnt, and the table top was hung from the rafters using the tough string from the Red Cross parcels. Meanwhile, back in Wellington, shifts of women volunteers toiled over the parcel assembly lines. The packing plant in Dixon Street was moved to a larger building in Tory Street, and parcel output improved by at least 25%. Men initially placed the cartons into wooden shipping crates they made up. Increasingly, this heavier work was undertaken by women too. Women all over New Zealand were now working in occupations formerly almost the exclusive preserve of men across every major industry, on farms and throughout the bureaucracies. Another 10,000 Kiwi women ended up in uniform across the military branches. Just before Christmas 1944, New Zealand sent its one millionth parcel in a ceremony presided over by Prime Minister Peter Fraser. This pales by comparison to other countries. Britain had already packed its one millionth parcel in June of 1942, and the United States sent 27 million parcels by the war's end. In total, New Zealand packed and sent 1,139,624 parcels by the end of World War II. But this means New Zealand packed a parcel for every 1.7 New Zealanders in its population by the millionth milestone in December 1944, and over 100,000 more thereafter while the U.S. packed one parcel for every six Americans. Also, the U.S. packing centres had conveyor belts. The New Zealand plant did not. The other salient feature of the Red Cross effort was distance, particularly in the case of New Zealand, and the fact that parcels were delivered, with very few losses, through major war zones. The route from New Zealand and Australia was stupendous, Often general cargo ships would have some room reserved for pallets of parcels. Almost invariably the rest of the shipping space was taken up by refrigerated meat carcasses and milk products. The ships left New Zealand and travelled through Central America, 
via the Panama Canal, where they refuelled, then turned north to sail up the east coast of the United States, where they were assembled into convoys near Halifax, Nova Scotia, for the dangerous Atlantic crossing. At almost every point the ships could be attacked. Travelling alone in the Pacific, they made full speed and described huge zigzags to confuse the aim of U-boats. German, and later Japanese, ship raiders and submarines were active all the way to New Zealand shores and accounted for several military and merchant ship sinkings in local waters. If ships survived the huge Atlantic convoy runs under attack by wolfpack groups of German submarines, they usually offloaded in Liverpool or London after a trip of over 20,000 kilometres. One ship from New Zealand was sunk off Scotland by German planes based in Norway. Over 50% of the ships of New Zealand's serving companies were sunk or damaged during the war, with a few Kiwi sailors ending up in the very camps they'd been delivering Red Cross supplies to. Of course, Germany was also sending Red Cross parcels to its own incarcerated men, following the route in reverse, shipping the parcels to Geneva, where it was distributed back onto the vessels and trains. The Allied Red Cross crates were marshalled together in England with those from other countries, although the US parcels went direct to Europe, and from the UK were routed to the neutral port of Lisbon in Portugal. Lisbon was a major trading port for all the belligerents through most of the war. Here too, Allied mail was put onto German planes, and German and Italian mail onto Allied, for distribution here and there, since both sides had literally thousands of POWs in enemy hands from 1943 onwards. The Red Cross parcels were stockpiled in huge warehouses and initially sent by train through Vichy France to Switzerland, but this caused many problems. Chief among them was Spain's different railway gauge and the fact that flooding and the Spanish Civil War had resulted in lasting and unresolved damage to Spain's rail system. Eventually, the Red Cross HQ in Geneva came up with a better solution. Custom-painted ships in white with large green stripes and a huge Red Cross symbol ablaze with lights to sail on pre-approved routes through the Mediterranean. Eventually, 321 ships sailed under ICRC flags, either directly ICRC owned or as multiple or single voyage charters. These successfully delivered the supplies from Lisbon's warehouses to the ports of Marseille or Toulon in southern France or to Genoa in Italy. From these ports the precious cargoes were loaded onto railway wagons for Swiss Red Cross warehouses in Valorbe and Geneva. Here the International Committee of the Red Cross stockpiled the crates and arranged distribution through German-occupied zones on German rolling stock in sealed wagons guarded by German soldiers who almost invariably respected the sanctity of the scheme. At the camps they were unsealed by authorised personnel and stockpiled in a sealed hut for eventual distribution with the Red Cross constantly liaising with the men of confidence in the camps on supply and demand and about best distribution models. Among the parcels were items of clothing and also medical supplies for prison medical staff, plus the aforementioned next-of-kin parcels. The final chapter of this global saga was that German authorities started to march POWs away from encroaching front lines. Partly, it may be surmised, this was to avoid trained men being liberated and rejoining the effort against Nazi Germany. Partly, it was to get them to safety. Some suspect the marches were simply a way of eliminating weaker POWs, since it was through a very harsh winter and men who fell out were often simply left behind in the snow. Roads were constantly being strafed and bombed and some POWs died as a result of Allied action. Many more died of exhaustion, cold, starvation and sickness. Incredibly, the International Red Cross arranged for a fleet of American trucks to be painted white and marked with large red crosses. The Red Cross arranged safe passage through German zones, safe not just from Germans but also from Allied air attacks. 
Amazingly, the Red Cross was keeping track of hundreds of groups of thousands of men wandering through collapsing Germany. The parcels were railroaded from Switzerland to Germany in a special 50-carriage train loaded with 500 tonnes of food where they were offloaded onto the US and US-driven trucks waiting near Munich. Many force-marched POWs went without and barely survived till liberation, but many also recorded actually receiving parcels even in these desperate times. Not one single truck of 60 was lost or significantly damaged throughout this effort. After the war, the Red Cross turned its attention to repatriating ex-POWs and displaced persons and helping the civilian survivors of the conflict. Coming up in a moment, a look forward to episode 9 in a couple of weeks' time. But first, as I mentioned right at the start, this episode is brought to you by lynda.com. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com. If you don't know Lynda, then they are the place to go if you want to learn something new, whether that be learning how to use a piece of software, or whether you want guidance on how to speak in public or negotiate a salary rise. It's really amazing the diversity of subjects that you can find on lynda.com. And by using the link lynda.com forward slash history net, you can get completely free and full access to every single one of their tutorials for 10 days. You've got nothing to lose and perhaps a lot to gain. Maybe you'll even find a new vocation you never knew you had. lynda.com is used by millions of people around the world and has over 3,000 courses on topics like web development, photography, visual design and business, as well as software training like Excel, WordPress and Photoshop. All of their courses are taught by experts and new courses are added on the site every week. Whether you want to set new financial goals, find a work-life balance, invest in a new hobby, ask your boss for a raise, find a new job or improve upon your current job skills in 2015, lynda.com has something for everyone. So here's all you need to do. Sign up for your free 10-day trial today by visiting lynda.com forward slash history net and you will get unlimited access to every course on lynda.com access to view tutorials on tablets and iphone plus android mobile devices and access to any new courses added every week angus and i have used lynda.com over the years as we've developed the history network and expanded it to produce the ancient warfare magazine podcast We've also used it in our day job lives as well. As you'll probably know already, the History Network is a spare time operation for Angus and myself. And the beauty is that it's always easy to find what you're looking for. And the content is always there and available if you need to refer to it once in a while or again and again. So go on, invest in yourself and sign up for a free 10 day trial to lynda.com by visiting lynda.com forward slash history net we challenge you to learn something new in 2015. Now, coming up in episode 9 in a couple of weeks is an episode written by Scott Forbes Crawford. And this is Flower Wars and Hungry Gods Warfare of the Aztecs. So we're heading back to the 15th and 16th century. Some of you may remember that Scott has written other episodes for us before, the Battle of Carrie and the Taiping Rebellion. But in this one, we'll be heading back to look at, among others, the Mexica, a once scorned nomadic people, but ultimately who became the dominant power in the area. So join us for that in a couple of weeks, and we look forward to you joining us then. Now, just as Mark and others have done, do you want to write a script on a topic we've not covered? Why not drop us a line? Some of our most popular episodes have been written by listeners. There are other ways you can support us and get involved. There is the donate button at the website, thehistorynetwork.org. You can also find our past seasons there, which are chaptered files for download and each of them has a running time of between around two and five hours, depending on the season, and you'll pay just £2 for each of these. 
You can get involved on the social side as well. Search for The History Network on Facebook and like our page. Follow us on Twitter. We are at History Network on there. Go to youtube.com forward slash user forward slash The History Network and take a look at our YouTube channel. There's lots of content there, including the video podcast we produce for Ancient Warfare magazine. And if you'd like to let us know what you think, give us some ideas about podcast subjects you'd like to see come up, or want to bring us up on an error or point of contention, then whatever it is, it's info at the History Network for that. We would love to hear from you. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the History Network dot org podcast written by Mark Webster, read by Nick Barker. <laughs>